good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Take your hymnals. We'll start out with number 146. 146. Stand with me if you're able. Shelter in the time of storm. 146. <laughs> the Lord's our rock. In him we hide. Shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary land a weary land oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a shelter in the time of storm oh rock divine oh refuge dear a shelter in the time of storm in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. Brother Nathan, will you open the service in prayer? Amen. You may be seated. 150, 150, my faith is found, a resting place. 150. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. 
died and that he died for. Verse number four. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. Remember, on Sunday, we have the fellowship lunch uh, at, uh, after the morning service. And then in the evening, we have Andrew and Amber, Amber Garcia, missionaries going to Honduras, that will be with us Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Youth rally on Friday the 8th, uh, coming up in a week and a half at 7 o'clock in Pearson, and then... Uh, the teen quiz will be on um, Saturday the 9th in Tinley Park. Now, I haven't s talked to Bob about the uh, deacons meeting, but we'll tentatively plan it for the, the 9th at 7.30. Does that work with you, Paul? 9th uh, has to be a little early because i got to get going to Tinley Park. But there's, there's not a whole lot to discuss. I think it'll be fairly short and sweet. Um, the, re the others aren't here to ask. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll plan on that. And then if we have that on the 9th, then we can have the business meeting after the service on the uh, 13th. Then coming up, the Easter cantata will be on Easter Sunday, the 17th, and the Spring Revival May the 15th through the 18th with Caleb Reed. I'm sure that will be a blessing. Um, take your hymnals again, 153, just a few hymns over. 153, how firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. God is still on the throne. How many know this song? We got one. We got two. We got a couple up here. Very good. You know, 
Not too many people know it, so I'm going to ask um, at least the piano, organ if you are familiar with it, to play it through for us. back up to the top of the page. All right, good song, let's sing it. Have you started for glory and heaven? Have you left this old world far behind? In your heart is the comforter dwelling. Can you say praise the Lord, he is mine? The ones that one walked on the highway Gone back and you seem all alone Keep your eyes on the prize For the home in the skies God is still on the throne God is still on the throne And he will remember his own Though trials may press us Burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne, he never forsaketh his own. His promise is true, he will not forget you. God is still on the throne. Burdened soul is your heart growing weary. With the toil and the heat of the day Does it seem that your path is more thorny As you journey along on life's way Go away and in secret before Him Tell your grief to the Savior alone He will lighten your care For He still answers prayer God still on the throne. God is still on the throne, for he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne, he never forsaketh his own. Promise is true, he will not forget you. God is still on the throne. You may live in a tent or a cottage, unnoticed by those who pass by. But a mansion for you he is building in the beautiful city on high. It will outshine the wealth and the splendor of the richest on earth we have known. He is architect true, and he's building for you. God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. Trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne, he never forsaketh his own. His promise is true, he will not forget you. God is still on the throne. Again is the promise to 
disciples when he went away. In like manner as he has gone from you, you will see him returning someday. Does his tarrying cause you to wonder? Does it seem he's forgotten his own? His promise is true. He is coming for you. God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne. He never forsaketh his own. His promise is true, he will not forget you. God is still on the throne. Amen. Good hymn, isn't it? Kind of goes along with what we're going to be speaking about tonight. And so I just dug that one out. One that we had in our hymn book when I was growing up. Before we uh, turn to the scripture, uh, Brother Andy passed me five tickets to a S Easter production at the Mech in Shipshawana. Um, this is on Friday, April 1st, at 7 p.m., and there's five tickets that um, he was given. He's not able to go, so uh, anybody wants one of these, um, we'll have them on the back table, and you can take as many as you can use. There's five of them here. So we'll have them on the back table after the uh, service. James chapter 1 tonight. James chapter 1, the last few Wednesday evenings, we have been dealing with how God would have us to react in times of troubles, in times of uh, uh, stress, in times of, of trials and, and troubles and temptations. And tonight I'd, look, uh, I'd like to look at a different side of that and the response that the Lord would have you and I to have when He brings adversity into our lives. When, he, when there is God-designed adversity in our lives, um, and it's never without a reason. Can I say that? God does not sit up in heaven wondering how He can pick on us. Like an older brother does to his younger brother or sister, you know. No. No, he loves us and everything he does is for a reason, not only for a reason, for our good. And so how would he have us to, um, uh, how would we, he have us to use this to conform us into his image and to bring us to a perfect uh, being as Jesus Christ? I want to read something. I, It's kind of lengthy, but... Um, this is a, a, a excerpt that I've kind of summarized with, uh, from A.W. Tozer, um, a, a minister from um, the, another generation, the early 1900s. And he writes, It was the enraptured Rutherford, he's speaking of another uh, Presbyterian minister from the 1600s, who could shout in the midst of serious and painful trials, praise God for the hammer, the file, and the furnace. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself here. James chapter 1, we haven't read the scripture yet. And so we're going to read the scripture that goes along with this excerpt by um, Brother uh, A.W. Tozer. And that is James 1, verses 1 through 12. James chapter uh, James 1 chapter 1 verses 1 through 12 James the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting my brethren count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, 
that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and the detail of it so that we can study it and then uh, a couple months later or a year later study it again and see something completely new. And so, Lord, I pray that tonight there will be uh, something out of the old word of God that is completely new for our lives. Lord, I pray that you be glorified in our time tonight, in the time that we've set aside to worship and to praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Not often that I, I read a, a large excerpt like this, but as I was reading through Tozer, um, A.W. Tozer, it just... Uh, spoke to my heart, and I thought, well, there's really no way that I can steal that <laughs> and put it in my own words and uh, not feel bad about it. So I'm going to read a little bit here. He says uh, that it was the enraptured Rutherford who could shout in the midst of serious and painful trials, praise God for the hammer, the file, and the furnace. The hammer is a useful tool, but the nail, if it had feeling and intelligence, could present another side of the story. For the nail knows the hammer only as an opponent, a brutal, merciless enemy who lives to pound it into submission and to beat it down out of sight and clinch it into place. That is the nail's view of the hammer. hammer. And it is accurate except for one thing. The nail forgets that both it and the hammer are servants of the same workman. Let the nail but remember that the hammer is held by the workmen, and all resentment toward it will disappear. The file is more painful still, for it is bi it, its business is to bite into soft metal, scraping and eating away the edges till it has shaped the metal to its will. It is the master and not the file that decides how much shall be eaten away and what shape the metal shall take, and how long the painful filing shall continue. Let the metal accept the will of the master, and it will not try to dictate when or how it shall be filed. As for the furnace, it is the worst of all. Ruthless, savage, it leaps at every combustible thing that enters it. All that refuses to burn is melted into a mass of helpless matter without will or purpose of its own. And when everything is melted that will melt, and all is burned that will burn, then and not until then, the furnace calms down and rests from its destructive fury. Now with all this known to him, how could Rutherford find it in his heart to praise God for the hammer, the file, and the furnace? The answer is simply that he loved the master of the hammer, he adored the workman uh, who wielded the file, and he worshipped the Lord who heated the furnace. Such doctrine as this does not find much sympathy among Christians in these soft and carnal days. This was written in the 30s, I believe. We tend to think of Christianity as a painless system by which we can escape the penalty of past sins and attain heaven at last. The flaming desire to be rid of every unholy thing and to put on the likeness of Christ at any cost is not often found among us. The devil, things, and people being what they are, it is necessary for God to use the hammer, the file, and the furnace in his holy work of preparing a saint for true sainthood. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. The Apostle Peter says, 
humble him. Without doubt, we of this generation have become too soft to scale to the great spiritual heights. Salvation has become to, to, to mean deliverance from unpleasant things. Our hymns and sermons create for us a, a religion only of consolation and pleasantness. We overlook the place of the thorns and the cross and the blood. We ignore the function of the hammer and the file. Strange as it may sound, it is yet true that much of the suffering we are called upon to endure on the highway of holiness is an inward suffering for which scarcely an external cause can be found. We all have only to look at the, the life of Job for that. For our journey is an inward journey, and our real foes are invisible to the eyes of men. Attacks of darkness, of despondency, of acute self-depreciation may be endured without any change in our outward circumstances. Only the enemy and God and the hard-pressed Christian know what has taken place. The inward suffering has been great and mighty work of purification has been accomplished, but the heart knows its own sorrow and no one else can share it. God has cleansed his child in the only way he can. Circumstance being what they are, we thank God for the furnace. Job, like nobody else in history, certainly recorded history, knew what God was, knew the furnace of God. He said, when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold, speaking directly of that smelting process. And this is the, the, the tenor or the theme of the, these verses in the book of James tonight. This is the message from Pastor James, who is, who is uh, speaking, as he said, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Here we have the tribes of Israel who had converted to Christianity and believed on Jesus Christ, and, and they were scattered because of persecution, driven from their homes, driven, some of them, I'm sure, from everything they owned, escaping only with what they had on their back, and... And, and this is who the Pastor James at Jerusalem is preaching to. But what God does is never without purpose. It is never random. And so I want to look tonight at, at, at some of the purposes, some of the things that God is trying to teach us when he is the design behind the adversity that we're facing, the trials and temptations as this verse 2 says, the diverse temptations. And so, number one, I want to look at the purpose. In verses 2 through 4, we have the purpose. James tells these new Christians who are undergoing persecution to count it all joy. Why? God is still in control. God is still on the throne. He is still watching out. He is still in control. And there is no other reason... That any one of these who were running, maybe for their lives, maybe to escape persecution, could thank God, could count it all joy. That was the only reason that many of them had to count it all joy, and that was that God was still on the throne. God was still in control. He had a purpose, this realization. Now, you and I can see the reason. We know that it was for the spreading of the gospel. It, it was so that where, wherever they went, they spread the gospel. They told the news of, of the Lord, and churches were growing and, and being born wherever they went. And now we see that. We know that. But they didn't see that. They didn't understand that when they were going through it. And so there's three different reasons or purposes, maybe I should say, since we're talking about the purpose, um, that James mentions in verses uh, two through four, that we should count it all joy when we uh, have these temptations and trials and, and troubles come upon us. Number one reason or the purpose is to prove us. That's the, the, the purpose that God has brought this into our lives. It is to prove us. Verse number three says, the trying of your faith. Okay, so the trying of your faith is to reveal to us whether our faith is genuine or whether our faith is fake. 
It's not to reveal to God anything. He knows everything. It is to reveal to me whether I am truly putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ or not. The word trying has that connotation, or maybe I should say the connection with uh, metallurgy where they're, they're, they're melting down the, or, or testing the metal uh, to, to prove its hardness, to prove if it's already cured and they're, and they're trying it, trying what is already um, tempered, then that, that, that's a different um, side of it, would be they're trying it um, to prove its strength and capability, not to see if it'll snap. No, it's to show and to prove to the world just how strong it is. And so the Lord uses this word in, in other uh, ways as well. First Corinthians, um, our works are tried by the fire. The Lord said in Psalm 12 and verse 6, his word was tried by the fire. Um, the words of the Lord are pure words, silver, tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And so the idea that the Lord is presenting here is not that the one doing the testing is skeptical about it, or, or the one that is doing the examining is negative, but rather he wants to prove to those, to, to the world, to everyone, to Satan, that this metal chain or whatever it is that's being tested, it, it, it will stand the test. It is of high quality. It will, it will not fall apart. And, and we see that when the Lord allowed uh, Satan to test Job. Was the Lord knew that, that his faith was strong. The Lord knew that it would stand the test. And yet Satan himself said that, um, doth Job serve God for naught? It, his faith isn't real. And so God gave Satan the permission to attack his faithful servant Job, not so that God could see what would come of it. No, God already knew. But so that he could show everyone, the whole world, even Job himself, even Satan himself, that Job's faith was real. Whether he's in prosperity or whether he was in um absolute depths of despair, lost all of his children, lost all of his wealth, lost everything, even his health. But he's still faithful to the Lord. In the parable of the sower, Jesus described many whose faith was not genuine. He, he described those who would not hold up in the heat of the sun and those that when they got trodden down or choked out by the weeds... But if there, your faith is genuine, then when adversity comes, you grow taller, you grow stronger, you, you overcome. And so that is the, the thought there as well. Rather than wilting in the times of, of the heat of the sun or being trodden down or whatever it is in the time of trial and testing. So, so first of all... <clears throat> The Lord has given the purpose of these trials are to prove our faith. Secondly, it is to prepare us. To prepare us, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work. Patiently continuing on uh, in the midst of trials, in the midst uh, of troubles, in the midst of these temptations, as this verse says, heightens your level of endurance. It gives you a, a, a longer endurance. And he says he is, he says that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, the idea is not patience that you're able to hang on. You, you're, you're able to hang on just a, a little bit longer. You know, there's the, the story... I forget what it's from my from my youth of the guy that, that there was a car falling over a cliff and he he was able to hold on until the tow truck uh, got there. He was able to hold it from going over the cliff. I forget the details of it, but once the tow truck got there, he completely collapsed. 
That, that's not the idea that he's giving here, that we're barely able to hang on and we're patiently waiting for somebody to come along and, and save us. No, the idea is that, that we see is that with patiently uh, continuing on in obedience to the Lord, we gradually see a strengthening of our faith, faith as we consistently daily obey. For anyone who has uh, ever um, maybe worked out or had a, a exercise program, you'll understand that concept. You set a time each day where you're going to try your muscles. You're going to make them work. And uh, maybe a little harder today than you did yesterday. And you patiently continue on day after day doing this uh, regimen that you set up for yourself. Even though it's discouraging, you patiently get up and do it again. Even though um, it seems as though it, that you're not getting anywhere. Maybe it seems senseless and uh, it takes work. But after you faithfully continue doing this, uh, patiently doing this exercise day after day for two months, all of a sudden you're starting to see that you're able to endure longer. You're able to, to, to uh, hold a, a little bit more weight or you're able to run a little, little bit longer and, and not be out of breath. And so this is the idea that he's given us. He, 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 he uh, brings these temptations or trials into our lives so that we can build up our endurance as we day by day exercise our faith with the Lord and, and grow stronger and endure longer. That is the way it is with God's designed adversity. Not only to prove us, but to prepare us. A fitness coach will tell you, um, uh, Brother Merrifield knows uh, Sergeant Satterfield. He's, uh, he's quite a, uh, a guy, a fitness guy. And, uh, and he'll always tell you, he'll say, your mind is your worst enemy. You are stronger than you think. You're stronger than you think, but your mind is telling you, I can't. Your mind is telling you to give up. And so 80% um, of the battle is gone if you can conquer your mind. And so it is spiritually. God has promised it you that he will not allow you to be tempted above your able. Yeah. And what does our mind constantly tell us? I'm not able to resist. I'm not able to... Uh, to, to do that. I'm not able to escape. We constantly are telling ourselves that what God is, well, essentially that God is a liar and that he tempted, allowed us to be tempted above that we were able. I think that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that verse, when he says, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. I don't think that that phrase bear it uh, once more means just barely hang on until help arrives. I don't think that's what it means. I think that it means that you will be able to get under it and you'll be able to bear it up and walk away with it just like Samson did the gates of Gaza. Uh, Samson had an obstacle in his way and through the power of the Holy Spirit upon his life, he picked up the whole gates of, of Gaza or Gaza whichever way you say that, with the posts and the bars and everything. And he walked, some theologians say that it was over 20 miles until he got to the top of Mount uh, of the hill close to Hebron. He, he didn't leave him in the valley. He took him right to the top of the mountain. And he left him there as a display to the enemies that were watching in the, in, in, in the trees. I think that's what it's saying. I think what he's saying is... is is ye may be able to bear it. I think what he's saying is through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Samson picked up those gates and walked away like it was nothing, you can walk up to the obstacles that the world of flesh and the devil put in your way and you could just put them on your shoulders and walk away in the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you try it on your own, you're not going to get anywhere. Not only is it to the... Is this uh, to the purpose to prove us and to prepare us, but then it is to perfect us. He allows all this that we may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
It matures us. If you and I never have any trials, if you and I never have any uphill battles to fight or, 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 or mountains to climb, we'll never be strengthened, we'll never grow, we'll never develop. And so the Lord says, I bring these trials and these storms and these frustrating times into your lives so that you'll have adversity that you can look back on and say, I grew out of that. I grew out of that. Would you take your car to a mechanic that only ever did oil changes? No, I wouldn't take my car there. I want to take my car to a guy that's got uh, bunged up knuckles and has, has experience in fixing everything that can go wrong with that car. Why? Because he had trouble, trouble, trouble day after day after day and he figured out how to get through it that's the mechanic i want to take my car to you know i was reading through the life of david or actually i still am reading through the life of david in my uh, devotions and um david and his brothers you read david and his brothers and and his cousins and his uh his nephews joab and abishai and these were fierce guys these these were guys that grew up on the farm and they knew work and they knew adversity and da david was a young teen and, and, and those in Saul's army were already uh, talking about him like he was a mighty man of valor, a man of war. And um, hey, what happened with David's sons? We don't read of a single son of David that ever went to war anywhere. What happened? They didn't grow up on the farm. They didn't grow up uh, having a lion attack the sheep. Having a bear attack the sheep. Why didn't David's sons turn out to, to be tough? Well, 1 Kings chapter 1 gives us a clue. It says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time, saying, why hast thou done so? We do our kids no favors by not l letting them go through a trouble here and there. Now, it's our job to protect them. But when we have this idea that I believe that David had, where, where he had this idea, I, I, I want to protect them from all the troubles that I went through, Arby Willett says, Adonijah was the first snowflake. <laughs> His father had never said no to him. David didn't require anything. He wanted them to have opportunities that he hadn't had, and he wanted them to avoid the trouble that, that had formed him into the man that he was. Never required them to work and to train and to serve and to... And to uh, join the army and to learn how to fight and wear that uh, armor. And so they grew up with soft and, and with no character whatsoever. That's why the Lord lets us go through God-designed adversity. Because he wants Christians with character. He wants Christians that are perfected. That will stand against the, the attack of the devil and not back down. There has to be a perfecting. There has to be a development. There has to be um, this uh, perfecting. And so, you know, maybe, maybe if we had spiritual eyesight to see what God was doing, um, to understand the, re the end result of the trial that you're going through and what it's going to do in my heart and and where I'll be after it's all done, maybe I wouldn't pray so hard that God would remove it. Maybe I ought to have more faith in Him. And that I should pray and thank Him for the trial. Count it all joy when I go through these diverse temptations. Because... I can have confidence that it's for my good. 
though I don't see it, it's for my good. Well, I am watching the clock and it's hurrying on. Let me just mention quickly these last three points that I have. Um, the first one was the purpose. The second one is the prayer, verses 5 through 8. We have, uh, first of all, in verse number 5, the, the prayer's focus. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know, this has been the prayer of many a student entering exam week. And, uh, but it's not talking about wisdom for supernatural uh, answers to random questions on a test. No, it's linked directly to adversity and linked directly to the uh, hardships that we're going through. We need to draw near to the Lord and seek his wisdom for the difficulties that we're facing. He told the disciples, I mentioned on si Sunday, watch and pray. A lot of times we'll do one or the other. Both are important. Watch and pray. God's wisdom will not necessarily bring me answers to all the questions or necessarily re re relieve the anxiety that I'm going through. But the verse, um, this verse promises God's wisdom. It doesn't promise that God will explain what he's doing. It promises his wisdom. It promises solutions to our problems, not answers to our questions. And so... It was when uh, we mentioned Job. Job, God gave Job all kinds of wisdom. Look at the, the book of Job and, and read it verse after verse. But Job didn't have a clue what was going on. This wisdom will help us to rise above the problems and see the victory ahead. Just like Jesus, who, I mean, I mean he, he, he looked beyond the cross. He despised the cross. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. And so that's what God's wisdom will do for us. It'll give us solutions to our present anxiety. Though we don't even understand what we're going through. It will, it will lift us above the problem. You know, if you look carefully at this verse. God is not promising unconditional wisdom. He is promising, in, in other words, so that we'll understand all the, the details... He is promising inexhaustible wisdom. Not unconditional, inexhaustible. Exactly when you need it for that exact situation, God will give a solution. And he doesn't scold us. He wants us to come. He's so gracious. Come boldly under the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Secondly, not only the prayer's focus, but the prayer's hindrance. We hinder our faith when we doubt. God's response to our prayer for, for wisdom is based upon our faith. It's based upon whether we come questioning his goodness and questioning his purpose and, and questioning whether he's really sovereign and questioning whether he's really in, in control. James is not saying that we should not come to God with our questions. He's saying we shouldn't come to God questioning God. His power, his wisdom, his purpose. We ought not to come doubting. But let him that ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Then uh, thirdly, we have the perspective Verses 9 through 11, the perspective, first of all, of the poor. The brother of low degree, uh, was he, he was the one with, with no money. We're talking, contrasting here, the one that is poor with the one who is rich. You know, these especially who had fled Jerusalem and many of the other tribes without um, any able to take anything with them, they found themselves destitute with nothing. Of low degree. Then there was others that didn't have money to begin with. And James tells the brother of low degree to rejoice. Uh, even in trials, rejoicing, not, not boasting in his own person, but rejoicing 
in the position that he had in Christ. He was a child of God. Though the earth had taken everything away from him, maybe driven him even out of his own country, Israel, Jerusalem, wherever it was that um, was, was home to them. But they, because of their position as a child of God, they were not forgotten by God. They, were, they, they, they had the glories of eternity ahead of them where their tears would be wiped away and any remembrance of, of what they had suffered would be wiped away as well. They were citizens of heaven. And then of the rich, the per per perspective of the rich in verses 10 and 11, the, man, the rich man was told to rejoice when he was made low. Why? Because the, rip get all, the rich get all wrapped up in, in the treasures of this world and success that they, they forget to make plans and they forget to lay up uh, for eternity and they forget to have uh, their treasure laid up in heaven. Mark chapter 10 says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's got so much going through his, his uh, head all day and all night about what he's going to do with those riches. And so the uh, Apostle James here, he's like, when you're made low, when, when, you, when you lose the, those riches and you uh, have an opportunity, God, count it joy. Why? Because you've got an opportunity to focus on what is, what is eternal. Now, this is, this is true of the unsaved as well. I, I believe that this is speaking to the saints. I believe it's talking to the saved because he refers to them as brother in verse number 9, the brother of low degree. But it's true for the unsaved as well. And then, quickly, uh, the last thing I want to mention is the promise in verse number 12. God promises the faithful man will be blessed. He will come out stronger he will, he will have more faith. He will have a happier outlook with a deeper love for God and for others because and not in spite of his trial. Once again, we could go back and look at the life of Job and read the 42nd chapter and we would find this all to be true. I'm going to skip down through here. Um, I, I, I do want to be respectful of your time. But um, in the end, God doesn't promise a good feeling. He, although we'll all have good feelings in heaven. But he promises a crown of life as a reward. Crown of life. Not only eternal life, but rewards for a life of faithful service. We see the crown of life mentioned again over in uh, Revelation chapter 2 with the church in Smyrna. It is mentioned as well. Um, with the martyrs who gave their lives for uh, to be faithful unto the Lord. Many crowns um, that we could mention in, in Scripture, but um, not take time for that tonight. If only we would have time, uh, pardon me, not time. If only we would have the faith to believe God, how much more pleasant life could be from day to day. If I could just rest in God today, rather than be all worked up, it doesn't change anything. Just because I'm all worked up and frustrated and, and completely in a tizzy all the time, fretting and fearing and, and living in defeat in the middle of my trial doesn't make it better. In fact, it makes it worse. It doesn't change a thing. But if I could lay all that aside and put a smile on my face and count it all joy... What a difference it would make. Because God sees. God understands. God cares. God will work it out for our good. You know, I, we, we read through the Gospels and you, and you see all the mistakes of the disciples. And, and, um, and you think, how could the Lord use them? You know, how many times did Peter put his foot in his mouth? Um, and, and the Lord still used him. But we see over in the book of Acts where they finally got what the Lord was trying to tell them. And it says that the, the, um, the high priest and the council brought them in and beat them in Acts chapter 5. And what did they do? 
they left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his sake. Amen. They weren't upset at all. Why? Because they realized the program of God now. They realized that God was in control and everything that happened, of everything that happened, nothing was going to happen unless it was for their good because they served a God that loved them. If only we could get that. Wouldn't our li lives be easier? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to Thee in prayer. I pray that as now we turn um, the service over to our prayer requests and our time of uh, lifting our voices to Thee, that, that You would hear our cries, our petitions, our thanksgiving. Lord, I pray that You would help us to thank You more for all the things that You do for us and for Your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.